Previously on my cool story. Investigations have so far confirmed the involvement of the following in the abortive coup plot. There are Major General Maman Basa, Brigadier Nasarawa, Group Captain David Ipeme, Group Captain Salahuddin Latinwo, Lieutenant Colonel Chris Oche, Lieutenant Colonel Mike Iyoshe, Lieutenant Colonel Musa Bition, Lieutenant Colonel Moses Effion, Lieutenant Colonel Emmanuel Obeya, Wing Commander Damu Sakaba, Wing Commander Ben Ekele, Commander A.A. Oguji, Squadron Leader Martin Luther, and Major Daniel Bamidele. Furthermore, Mike invited you to Makodi, where the plans were discussed in full. Why did you refuse to attend? A clever plotter you think you are. To cap it all, you gave Mike a ride, during which he briefed you on the plans. The conspiracy charge is therefore confirmed. See you then at the stake, my friend. I denied any knowledge of the coup or any invitation to go to Makodi. I agreed that Lieutenant Colonel Yoshe and I were cosmates, neighbors and fellow instructors at Command and Staff College Jaji, but our friendship had been strained by some events of the past two years, to the extent that he could not have confided in me such sensitive issues as coup plans. I then went on to narrate the events that strained our relationship and why he wanted to rope me in. The genesis of our trouble was early in December 1983 when I came back from a course in Camberley, UK. I gave Yoshi a call and joked that he was wanted by the Nigerian security organization NSO. He took great exception to this and warned me to desist from such an expensive joke with him. I sensed something was wrong or that he was in a bad mood and I apologized. I later realized how dangerous such a joke was, especially as some officers were then in detention for suspected coup attempts and more so, Buhari's coup which actually pulled off on December 31st, 1983 had by then reached an advanced planning stage. The guard brigade where Yoshe was the brigade commander was in the thick of the plans. I had committed an indiscretion. Then came another burst with Yoshe in early 1984. By this time, he had been posted to the command and staff college after a narrow escape from retirement. He had shown open disappointment at his being kept out of Buhari coup plot despite the fact that his brigade played a major role. While in Jaji, he confronted me with a letter written by an English gentleman who alleged that while I was in Britain, I told him that he was no more in the service. I denied this and explained how the gentleman and I met, and when he asked after him and his current address, I had told the man that Mike Yushi and I were friends, but that I did not know his current address. I explained to Yoshi that it was for security reasons, being the brigade major of Guards Brigade. He did not believe. Rather, he thought I wished to see his exit from the service. He added, we will see who will leave the service first. I did not take him seriously but laughed at such a childish and emotional outburst. However, I wrote the English gentleman stating that I never told him Mike Yoshi was no longer in the army. He replied promptly, apologizing for any misunderstanding he might have caused between both of us. He said it was his fault that he got the wrong impression from our discussion. I showed the letter to Yoshi. He seemed not to have been convinced. Almost at the same time, Mike Yoshi again confronted me with an allegation that I had written a letter of complaint to Army Headquarters about his promotion to the local rank of a lieutenant colonel while I was still a major. It never rains, it pours. Again, this was a lie. I did not write such a letter. However, that observation had been raised at one of the Chief of Army Staff conferences. I did not attend the conference and I do not know who raised the observation. But I made it clear to Mike Yoshi that I did not envy him and that both of us would be promoted to the substantive rank of Lieutenant Colonel at the appropriate time. All this happened between December 1983 and March 1984. These misunderstandings were capable of causing bad blood between us and they did. This I told the interrogators and the MIP. When confronted, Yoshi agreed but said we had made up. Did he really forget? No. A lot of water passed under the bridge during the following weeks. A few more people were arrested and detained. The decree number one of 1986 stipulating the offenses and punishment of treason was promulgated and members of the tribunal were named and sworn in. They were Major General 
Charles Ndiomu, Brigadier Johanna Kuri, Commodore Mutala Nyaku, Colonels Rufus Kupolati and Ekundayo Opalaye, Group Captain Antony Ikazobo and Mr. Maman Nasarawa, a police officer. The first charge sheet contained only 10 names. Major General Maman Vata, Lieutenant Colonel Musa Biti Young, Lieutenant Colonel Kristen Oche, Wing Commander Adamu Sakaba, Wing Commander Sam Ikeli, Commodore Andrew Oguji, Major Dan Bamidili, Major Edwin West, Squadron Leader Asen Ahura, Squadron Leader Gabriel Odi. They appeared before the tribunal on their first sitting for mention. Two days later, a new charge sheet appeared, including Lieutenant Colonel Mike Yoshi, Major Tobias Akwashiki, Squadron Leader Martin Luther, Captain Abiodun Sisi, and Lieutenant Dakwa and me. And the charge sheet read Major General Vata and 16 others. The 17 of us appeared in court on Wednesday, January 29, 1986, and were arraigned before the tribunal charged with conspiracy to commit treason. We all pleaded not guilty. Some problems cropped up which delayed the start of the proceedings that day. This included lack of lawyers for some accused persons and rejection of the membership of Group Captain Anthony Ikazobo. Hearing was adjourned till the following day, Thursday, January 30th. As early as 5.30 a.m. on Tuesday, February 25, 1986, the warders of Ikoi Prison came to open our cells. They asked us to take our bath and pack our belongings. It was Judgment Day. General Maman Vasa wanted to leave his personal effects behind to come back for them if released or return to them if convicted. The military escort Lieutenant Abdulkadir firmly but politely turned down the request. He told Major General Maman Vata that the order was that we should move out with all our personal effects since we would not be coming back to Ikwe Prison. At about 8.15 a.m., the Black Maria and a military jeep came for us and we were checked out. Within 20 minutes, we were at the Brigade of Guards headquarters where the court sat. The place was full of pressmen, armed soldiers and mobile policemen. There was a ferret car stationed at the entrance of the headquarters. Other armored vehicles were parked along Kofu Abayomi streets. There were also plain clothes security men sniffing around for information. The atmosphere looked tense. It was made more so by the presence of stern-faced and overzealous, gun-totting, uniformed men. As we alighted from the Black Maria, cameramen raced one after another to take our photographs. We were immediately shepherded into a room adjoining the courtroom. Before long, our consuls joined us to have last-minute chats of reassurance or dots the I's and cross the T's of our pleas of mitigation, which they had already prepared if the need arose. As I looked at my watch, the time was ticking away. It was now 9.30 a.m. and the court had not yet started. A military doctor and army captain was also at hand issuing an algestic to some that complained of feverish condition or headache. He was taking the blood pressure of those who felt ill. You cannot guess how high some people's pressure shot up. I suspected my pressure also rose, but I did not care to bother the doctor. Then about 9.45 a.m., Brigadier Mama Nasarawa, Wing Commander John Uku, and Lieutenant Peter Odoba were called in. They were those accused of concealing the coup plans. Within one and a half hours, they were finished with Judgment and sentence had been delivered. Brigadier Nasarawa was dismissed from the Nigerian army while Uku and Adoba bagged life jail. When we received the news, we took it as an indication of what would befall any of us found guilty. Then at 11.35 a.m., we were ushered in handcuff. The courtroom was jam-packed with military officers from three services as well as local and world press. At exactly 11.45 a.m., the president of the tribunal Major General Charles Indiomu started. Wing Commander J.B. Uku, the accused person, is guilty and hereby convicted of the offense of concealment of treason contrary to and punishable under Section 40, Subsection 2 of the Criminal Code. Major D.I. Bamidele, Wing Commander Ben Ekele, Wing Commander A.C. Sakaba, Lieutenant Colonel M.F. Young, 
Commander A. A. Ogwiji, Squadron Leader A. Ahura, Major D. E. West, and Major T. G. Akwachiki are guilty and are hereby convicted of the offense of conspiracy to commit treason contrary to and punishable under Section 37, Subsection 2 of the Criminal Code. The President divided the accused into three categories those not found guilty and those found guilty and of the first line and those found guilty and of the second line major james onyeki squadron leader gabriel odi captain abiodun sisi and lieutenant dakwa were discharged and acquitted those found guilty and grouped on that first line were major general vata lieutenant colonel musa bt young mike yoshi christian oche Andrew Oguji, Major General Dinobamidele and Squadron Leader Martin Luther, while Wing Commanders Ben Ekele and Adamwas Takaba. Major Tobias Akwashiki and Edwin West, Squadron Leader Asen Ahura and I were found guilty but grouped under the second line. The councils were hardly given any opportunity to plead for mitigation of sentence. When Maman Vasa requested for his handcuff to be relaxed, so that he could read his plea of mitigation, his request was turned down. A few of the counsel who wanted to read their pleas of mitigation of sentence were hushed. During the reading of his plea for mitigation of sentence by Major Daniel Bamidele, the tribunal president was seen dozing. After the pleas for mitigation of sentence, without rising to consider the pleas, the tribunal president there and then pronounced the sentences. To those found guilty, it was death, adding that it was a unanimous decision. The word rubbish slipped through my lips unguardedly. It was after I uttered it that I remembered where I was. Immediately after the sentence was passed, all the battery of cameras were searching for expressions on the faces of the condemned. They were looking for tear-filled eyes to record for posturing. What the first line and second line categories of condemned people meant baffled me to no end. Were we to be shot in those groups or order? Judgment given, sentences passed, the court rules. The condemned, the jailed, and those discharged and acquitted were all whisked off to Kirikiri Maximum Prison in two Black Maria vehicles. Wednesday at the Maximum Security Prison, Kirikiri, were usually not the best days. They were often dreaded, especially by inmates of the condemned cells. We did not know this because we were new. So when Wednesday, March 5, 1986 came, it was to us like the day before. Another day of waiting. Another day to sniff for news about our fates. It was not so to the other inmates of the condemned cells. They had an all-night prayer vigil to keep away the executioners. The cleaners usually from other cells did not show up for cleaning. They had not been released to do their work. At about 8 a.m., a team of warders led by the chief warder came and led out nine condemned prisoners for execution. A sullen silence fell on the whole building and indeed the whole prison. As their colleagues, especially those who had shared the same cells with them, expressed their sorrow as they communicated in muted tones. At 9 a.m. came the sound of rifle shots. They were being executed. The silence in condemned cells deepened. The lockup strength of Kirikiri prison had been reduced by nine men. Nine families had been bereaved. Nigeria had been cleansed of nine criminals at least according to the authorities. At about 10 a.m., we were opened out to take our bath and the cleaners were allowed in to do their work. The atmosphere was still overhung with silence, sadness and shock. A few of us went around to find out if any of those we knew was affected. General Vasa tried to chat us up and keep our spirit high. Meanwhile, the discussion of the morning execution, the largest in recent times, was gradually giving way to other discussions, some of which were a carryover of the previous day's discussion. Writing our wills, the visit of Professor Waleshwinka to President Ibrahim Babangida to beg him to spare our lives, 
and Mrs. Patricia Akwashiki's protest as reported in the Guardian newspaper regarding her husband's sentence. Little did we know that the Armed Forces Ruling Council was meeting. The only agenda of that meeting was to confirm our sentences. That afternoon, we had a meal of rice, a meal that had a large dose of pebbles with a watery stew sprinkled on it. In the circumstances, we ate hungrily and happily. At about 4 p.m., the assistant controller of prisons Kirikiri, Mr. Daniel Inshi, came to the cells to inform us to get ready for transfer. Those to be affected and their destinations were not disclosed. Though surprised, we started packing our belongings and giving out a few things to other inmates of the condemned cells. Meanwhile, we tried to hazard a guess to our destinations and the rationale for the transfer. Could it be for security? Could it have been thought wise to separate us? Whatever the reason, many of us believed that there was not going to be any execution since coup convicts were not usually executed separately. We were hoping and praying that we would be transferred to state capitals where the prisons had better facilities. We also wondered how we were going, by road or by air. Surely, those going to nearby towns like Akure, Ibadan, Abiokuta, Bini would be going by road. In Black Maria, we assumed. Time was ticking away. It was now 6 p.m. Ben Ekele observed that the deteriorating weather condition would make night flight difficult for those going by air and ruled out, therefore, any transfer by air that night. He was a jet fighter pilot and one of the best at that, having been selected as the best fighter pilot in the Air Force for two years consecutively. No sooner had he finished speaking than we heard some footfalls approaching, almost stalking. There were those of some prison and military officers. They had come with a list of names, handwritten. The names were called out and I could hear Major General Maman Vata, Lieutenant Colonel Musa Bityong, Lieutenant Colonel Mike Yoshi, Lieutenant Colonel Kristen Oche, Major Daniel Bamidili, Wing Commander Ben Ekele, Wing Commander Adamu Sakaba, Squadron Leader Asen Ahura, Commodore Andrew Oguji, Squadron Leader Martin Luther. They all answered from their different cells. I guess they were those to go on the first flight. In fact, when Ben Ekele stepped out of our cell, he wanted to carry his belongings but was stopped with the promise that somebody would be detailed to do that. Innocently and eager to join his colleagues on transfer, Major Tobias Akwashiki was reported to have asked the warders, what about me? Am I not coming? If only he knew where our colleagues were going. He was however told it was not his turn. But then something struck me, pervading ominous signs. Ekele was immediately handcuffed as he stepped out of the cell. He was not allowed to take his baggage, though we were told we were going on transfer. The cleaners had again been withdrawn. There descended a sullen silence on the yard, the same eerie signs that preceded the morning execution. Could my imagination be playing tricks on me? I punctured the bubble that was trying to form, a bubble of death. If it was execution, were not 13 condemned, where were the other three? Only 10 were called out, so, so it cannot be execution. It just cannot be. Just then, my thought process was broken by... As a trained infantry officer, I knew these were rifle shots and from a distance of about 100 meters from where we were, it was unmistakable. Time was now 6.30 p.m. As the shots rang out, Oku sprang to his feet saying, Moses, did you hear that? Those guys are being shot. These people mean business. He lit a cigarette and started pacing up and down the 10 by 10 feet cell, looking at me in disbelief. He was inhaling and puffing away his cigarettes and repeating those words in parts and disjointedly that I could neither answer nor keep count of. He was chain smoking. I did not think he needed an answer from me either. Perhaps he was indirectly reminding me that I might be the next target. After all, he was serving life jail. Ten gone, three more to go. 
the transfer had turned out to be a hoax. Then Uku, Sese and I clung to one another, knelt down intuitively, crossed ourselves and prayed, more out of fear than a real desire to commune with God. Not quite long, a warder came to our cell. I froze. He opened the cell door and thereafter distributed the three of us into other cells. We were not sure what was his next line of action, for we still feared it was an unfinished business. It was now 8pm and dark. Uku and I were moved to join Odoba and Ode. We talked in hushed tones about the fake transfer, about the dead and the living, and about the tomorrow and the military and about Nigeria and almost everything far into the night, near the early hours of the next day. We were still in a deep state of shock. We all settled for some tablets of sedatives. I took tablets of Valium 5MG. We then prayed together and tried to sleep. None of us had up to two hours of sleep but passed a lot of urine that night as all our plastic urine receptacles were filled. This night was worse than the night of December 22nd, 1985 for me. Before 6 a.m., we were up again to pray, and after that I got myself prepared, or so I thought, to be called out. I started to rehearse my march to the stick. Should I sing or should I keep mum? Should I cry or should I wave to my executioners? Should I pray for forgiveness for my enemies or should I promise them brimstone? Should I reiterate my innocence? Should I send a message to my wife to look after my children well and remarry? I had not yet made up my mind. When the morning duty warders reported for duty and broke the news of the text of General Bali's broadcast the previous night to us. Part of the text read, Fellow, Fellow Nigerians, Nigerians. The coup plot uncovered in December 1985 has been a shock to the whole nation, which rules like one man to condemn the coup plotters and urge the federal military government to deal with those concerned in accordance with our laws. After considering all relevant factors, including the judgment of the Special Military Tribunal and the recommendations of the Joint Chiefs of Staff on those appeals, the Armed Forces Ruling Council in a meeting held earlier today has decided as follows. The case of Brigadier M. M. Nasarawa is to be further investigated with a view to having a retrial. Those who heard about the coup attempt and failed to make a report to the authorities are dismissed from the armed forces and in addition are sentenced to terms of imprisonment as follows. A. Wing Commander J. B. Uku, 5 years imprisonment. B. Lieutenant P. O. Odoba, 10 years imprisonment. The category of plotters who did not belong to the hardcore but were on the periphery and took part in the preliminary discussion of the coup attempt are sentenced to life imprisonment. They are 1. Lieutenant Colonel M. F. Young 2. Major D. E. West 3. Major T. G. Akwashiki the prime movers of the coup attempt to hatch the coup plot masterminded it, recruited others to join them and took the required military actions to implement it as sentenced to death by the firing squad. The officers in this group are Major General Maman Vata, Lieutenant Colonel Musa Bitiyong, Lieutenant Colonel C. A. Oche, Lieutenant Colonel M. Yoshi, Major D. I. Bamidili, Squadron Leader Martin Luther, Wing Commander B. Ekele, Commodore A. A. Oguji, Wing Commander A. C. Sakaba, and Squadron Leader A. Ahura. The officers who have been sentenced to death by firing squad were executed about an hour ago. The Armed Forces Ruling Council hereby appeals to all Nigerians and officers and men of the Armed Forces to be vigilant and continue to be patriotic and loyal to the government and the nation. 
this administration has bent over backwards to give the coup plotters a fair trial and a right of appeal. For reasons of our commitment to human rights and in consideration of the appeals made by various individuals and groups for clemency. Where there was any doubt, the Armed Forces Ruling Council has given the accused the benefit of the doubt and spared his life. In other cases, where there was no doubt, the death sentence has been imposed and executed. In the military, the punishment for treason is death.